Good morning. Um, for any of our new students who may have not met me yet, my name is Tatiana and I'm one of our campus pastors. And so I have the privilege to um, introduce our morning speaker. But before I introduce our speaker, I want to just commend and encourage this community. As someone who's called to care and pray for you and cover you and support you in any ways that I possibly can, it's been amazing to see this community support each other this week. And so just letting you know that you've encouraged me by seeing how you've loved one another so well this week. And so I want to continue um, to encourage you to look out for each other the remainder of this school year. Let's look out, let's ask for spiritual eyes for us to just be sensitive to the needs of this community. So with that being said, um, our morning speaker is one of our uh, associate professors of communication studies. Yes, and Starla Anderson, she has uh, experience as a trial consultant and as a prosecutor. And what she's going to do this morning is bring the word in a timely word. And we're going to see how God's placed this provisional word in her heart over the summer for such a time as this. So can we give a Friday morning welcome to Starla Anderson. start this morning by telling you that my heart is heavy with the burden of the loss that this community has experienced this week. I know many of you have lost a dear friend. And as a faculty member, I know that a lot of you are bravely carrying huge burdens on a daily basis. And what I want to tell you this morning is that we see each one of you in our classrooms. College is both exhilarating and exhausting. I'm sure you have already experienced that, even if you've only been here for two weeks. And um, one of the lowest points in my own life occurred when I myself was a student on this campus. And I'm here to tell you that the care and concern that I received from our university counseling office was what I needed to have a safe place to go when I, wanted, I needed to hit rock bottom. They were there for me when I was climbing back out of that dark hole to support me and to allow me to gain understanding of my past that completely changed the trajectory of my future. So you guys, that is not for weak people, that's for brave people. And if you need that, please go and seek out that help. We want to be resources for you. As faculty, come to us. If you don't know where to get help, we will guide you. We want to be there to support you. People on this campus spoke truth into my life and were, they believed in me before I was able to believe in myself and we are here to do the exact same thing for you guys. I chose to tackle stress and anxiety way back in July when I was asked to speak at this chapel because I didn't know what was going to happen this week, but I did know that what I experienced last academic year was heavier than anything that I had ever experienced in the 17 years before that as a faculty member. You know what, I, even though it doesn't matter how many degrees are behind somebody's name, I fight insecurities too. And I want to talk to you today, not about somebody who has already figured everything out and can be your Yoda, but I am talking to you today as somebody who wants to walk alongside you in this journey and be a support to you so that we can all live lives that are worthy of our calling. There are two four-letter words that I absolutely despise. These words rob us of confidence and self-worth. They imprison us, and they keep us from living the abundant life that God promises us in the Bible. These two words are fear and lies. Fear cripples us from pursuing opportunities when we dismiss those things because we believe the lies that Satan tells us. We often make excuses for our lack of self-discipline and allow those excuses to cause us to live frenetic lives that add to our stress levels, that make us feel like we are the only ones who are behind the eight ball. The enemy is at work in this, but I have to tell you that we um, contribute greatly to his efforts by our own poor planning as well. Simple little things can change the quality of each of your days. Simple things like replace that toilet paper when you get down to the last six pack rather than the last square so you don't have to run to the kitchen to grab paper towels. Or 
treating your gas tank like it's on empty at a quarter of a tank rather than E so that you will not find yourself late for class because you're stranded on the side of the freeway. Another thing you can do is ration out your reading and your work once a week so that when something comes up that you didn't expect, you are not caught off guard. All of those things are things within your control to reduce your anxiety. Another stressor I've encountered just this week is what am I supposed to major in? You, you think that that is going to determine that one decision dictates the rest of your life. That's not true. I'm here to tell you some of you know exactly where you're headed. Others of you are still open. But God knows where you're headed. You do not need to fear the unknown. My education was completely not traditional. So I knew I wanted to go to law school, but I got there by a double major in music education and communication studies with a political science minor. That is a mouthful. So what I didn't know, what at the time I thought that was really random, but God was orchestrating my life with the precision and beauty of a Renoir. This French Impressionist painter captured a path leading somewhere to something absolutely gorgeous, but you can't quite exactly make out what that end destination would be. I'm grateful for the two years and 16 units of music theory I needed because being a choir director and worship leader throughout grad school and law school helped pay the bills. It again supported me when I chose to leave the legal profession and be a, a stay-at-home mom for a period of my life. I'm still using that knowledge to this day because I have a very emotional 16-year-old who's at a performing arts school and is constantly in tears over music theory. Who would have guessed that? I married a politician and I practiced law. I thought communication was just for my own, profession, my own benefit, but it actually was used professionally on countless occasions. And who would have known that I would now have the opportunity to passionately impart these concepts to equip and empower students to engage in their own transformational scholarship. None of that was random. God knew exactly what he was preparing me for, and I am confident he knows exactly what he is orchestrating in your life as well. Last year, you heard my colleague, Dr. Davis, speak to you about the theology of work. She encouraged you that our work is God-given. It's God-blessed activities that provide opportunities for us to redeem a fallen world. Pursuing excellence in that work is an expression of our identity in Christ, and it provides us with opportunities to glorify Him, bringing us all a true sense of satisfaction. Her phrase, do darn good work, became so popular, I saw it on some keychains. Last year, I, um, I, I want to now add to that thought by exploring what does it look like to live daily in an abundant manner? So here's the mantra I want you to embrace. Through Christ, you already have more than enough to accomplish your goals this year as you embark, embark upon a new semester and academic year. To do that, I want to look at John 10, 9 and 10, to explore three aspects referenced there that I'm going to have you remember by define, time, and align. I want you to define or define for you what abundant life looks like, tell you the timing of when that begins, and then show you how aligning yourself with God, who I'm going to call our pack leader this morning, gives us tenacity or mental toughness to make our work sustainable so that we can truly believe we have what it takes to be capable of accomplishing those tasks that he has preordained for us to accomplish. John 10 verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. Abundant life is defined by Ed Stetzer in his 2015 Christianity Today article this way. Abundant life is not about what we have. It is not about what we get. It is not about what we claim. Ultimately, abundant life is about what we receive as a gift from the Lord and to live knowing that we are stewards of those blessings. At the end of the day, perhaps this is how we know if we have abundant life when we have shared our lives with others, 
When we have enough of the blessings of God, his mercy, his peace, his love, his grace, his wisdom to share with others and actually do it when we have those opportunities, that's when we can have truly abundant life. Now that you know what it is, when does it begin, and how does that relate to what you do for your work? Let me tell you, it, abundant life does not begin once you receive your first professional paycheck. The day you were, you were hired, the day that your acceptance letter from Azusa Pacific University landed in your mailbox. You are on the job today. Are you conducting yourself that way? What kind of characteristics do you want others to see in you as a working professional? Are you building those disciplines into your daily routine and work right now so it's sustainable in the future and second nature to you in the years to come? For example, I feel passionately that people all should be treated equally, regardless of their status in life, because everyone is made in the image of God. That core belief in me drives me in the way that I interact with my students every semester. What are your core values? What do you hope your work will reflect? Start using self-discipline to practice living those things out right now in the way that you engage in those part-time jobs, how you participate in your classes, how you interact with people like me, your professors, and the colleagues that are sitting next to you, and also how you do quality work product in the classroom and outside. John 10, um, confidence comes in this endeavor when we identify and align ourselves closely with God, the leader of our pack. John 10 verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and he shall go in and out and find pasture. There is freedom in knowing that regardless of where we are, God is already gone before us. He is our savior and he is providing the security detail that we all need. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We can pursue many different paths personally and professionally throughout our lives when we stand on that unshakable foundation of God. Our relationship with him provides doors and opportunities to use our gifts and knowledge to be a blessing to other people. I had an opportunity in a very strange way to embed this deeper into my uh, knowledge that I met a Labradane this summer. So please meet Dexter. Yes, he was caged up at the Upland Animal Shelter and we decided that we would take him home. Because he's only a year old and he's extremely large, we book, quickly booked a, a dog trainer. Upon his arrival, Mr. Belmonte spent five minutes in our entry challenging and sizing up our two dogs. He then informed us our problem was not the 65-pound Labradane. Our problem was Mia, the 13-pound white Maltese Schnauzer that had been running our household for the past eight years. Her anxiety level was so bad, she incessantly barked at him and when he challenged her. Her anxiety was just off the charts. He told us it was our fault. He said, you guys need to take control over this household and be the leaders of this pack. This poor little dog thinks that she is responsible for everyone's well-being. So as we began to take his advice and implement these techniques, her demeanor changed dramatically in two weeks. She started hanging out with us in whatever room we were in, rather than sitting on top of the couch, which really made me mad because it was white, in the front of our house, trying to see that everybody was safe. She also, instead of getting really, really mad at the large Labradane who wanted to play all the time, decided she would join in on playing because she now knew that both of them could be safe in our care. Watching this made me question some deep um, issues in my own life. Am I seeking out time with God and connection with my master as desperately as these two dogs aspire to be a part, a secure part of my family's unit or pack? Do I seek diligently to please him and have uncontainable excitement and joy when I get the opportunity to spend time in his presence? The dog trainer also said, hey, these dogs cannot think on your level, so quit treating them like humans, they're animals. 
And again, I was like, oh my goodness, that is me. I think that I can understand what God's doing and it's just not possible. I'm as limited to, in his ways as they are to ours. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything perfectly, with perfect clarity. All I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Here's the bottom line, guys. I don't have to know how everything fits together today, and neither do you. We just need to follow the Savior's lead and trust that he is protecting us. I need personally to rein in my tendency to pursue perfection at a frenetic pace and instead seek perspective that only God can offer me in the midst of unknown circumstances. When I relinquish that control, I can be at peace, much like Dexter and Mia hanging out with me in my office while I was preparing this talk for you this morning. When we stay close to God, the leader of our pack, we get to relax like that. Security is reflected in this concept of pasture. Our work can't be sustainable if we don't include with it periods of time of rest in the, or time in our pasture. Growing up on a farm, our cattle grazed in grassy fields marked by electric fences and barbed wire. The cows had a lot of freedom if they, and they were safe if they stayed away from the perimeter of the property. In my research on cows, I learned they're inclined to walk the fence when they have fear-induced anxiety. They would find themselves facing what I would like to call this morning the triple P if they got too close. That is, they would find themselves in pain-producing predicaments if they tested the boundaries. If anyone has ever had an episode with electricity, you know it is not pleasant. But I had to test that for myself, and I will never do it again. The goal of the farmer is to exert strong leadership such that the cattle remain calm and relaxed. According to Hibbert and Hanatow's online article, <clears throat> farmers are successful when their animals are grazing in random orientation, some lying down, and none of them wanting to walk off. They say, if we can learn how to settle our cattle properly, they will be happy and content where they are, and they won't walk the fence. Our poor Labradane Dexter is still working on finding that level of contentment at our house. <clears throat> this is Dexter trying to escape the yard, encountering the nasty Triple P. After a week of limping around, looking depressed and pathetic, a vet visit and two prescriptions, I'm hoping he's a fast learner and knows that the security of the boundaries of our yard are there for his safekeeping. Just as Dexter was likely suffering from fear-induced anxiety when he was left alone on the side yard, we experience anxiety as well and isolation often when we attempt to accomplish our tasks apart from God. We cannot do good work if we are paralyzed by fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We can quit walking that fence when we learn how to settle so our anxiety decreases, allowing room for our joy to increase. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I believe Satan is busy at work trying to debilitate many of us with fear. Francesca Battistelli captures this concept well in the lyrics of her breakup song. She writes, fear, you don't own me. There ain't no room in my, this story. And I ain't got time for you telling me what I'm not. Like you know me? Well, guess what? I know who I am. I know I'm strong and I'm free got my own identity. So fear, you will never be welcome here. There's no room for you here. I've had enough. The no vacancy sign on my heart is lit up. Goodbye, goodbye fear. You will never be welcome here. It takes strong self-discipline to consistently fight against our fallen human natures to live that kind of an abundant life that if we do, we can too can bear the fruits of the spirit that Jesus modeled so well for us. 
When we run at a frenetic pace, we tend to miss God's blessing, such as community and peace. Crates are terrifying things to dogs who've been rescued because they associate it with abandonment, not safety. When the trainer told us we needed to teach Dexter how to settle or calm himself, I wondered if that was even possible. But once again, he was right. Mia is doing her best here to show and support Dexter as he learns the art of calming his mind through spending time in his crate, which is the second crate, by the way, because he busted out of the first one we had to upgrade. Likewise, some of you have had experiences with earthly fathers or people in your life who have let you down. And that makes it more difficult for you to trust and to feel safe resting in the arms of your Heavenly Father. Please use your time here at APU to lean on the community around you so that you can better understand the depth of God's love for each one of you. I internalized another lesson from our Labradame that using self-control to slow down and gain perspective and settle myself helps me make better choices for not only me, but it gives me more capacity to serve others well. Maxie Dunham states in volume eight of the communicator's commentary that the purpose of self-control is that we may be fit for God, fit for ourselves, and fit to be servants of others. It is not rigid religious practice, discipline for discipline's sake. It is not dull drudgery aimed at exterminating all laughter and joy. It is the doorway to true joy, true liberation from the stifling slavery of self-interest and fear. The sheep referenced in John 10 are able to go in and out freely because they feel safe knowing that their shepherd is there and guiding them to safe pastures. Similarly, we need that rest and opportunities to restore our souls on a daily basis to settle ourselves so we don't run out of steam in our work and stray from our master. Psalm 2911 says, The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. After 22 years here at APU, I'm quite familiar with the patterns of the academic calendar. We all start out energetic and ready and eager to dive into our classes, and then the stress of midterms and projects starts to build, and that causes us to limp into finals and then finally breathe a deep sigh of relief when it's all over. We convince ourselves that we don't need to rest during that time because we can go to the pasture during Christmas or summer break. What would it look like if we stopped the madness and we began to change this pattern on a daily and weekly basis so that we could build reserves to weather those busier times a little better? Do you guys have a pasture? Where do you go to rest and put things in perspective? My, one of my favorite places is driving up to Mount Baldy and pulling at the little, going to the pullout and walking at the city lights below. When I'm in the valley, everything seems so big, but up there, so tiny. Another idea is my pastor walks outside at the end of each day. He looks up at the stars and he's reminded that the God who created that vast, beautiful night sky is more than able to carry his burdens that he had gathered throughout the day. He does a handoff right then and there so that he can go back into his house, lay his head down on his pillow, and rest peacefully each night. Our fast-paced culture doesn't encourage this type of perspective taking. We need to use self-discipline to fight to find a rhythm of spending regular time with God if we hope that we could to thrive in the midst of circumstances that are often very chaotic. The app First Five is an easy download for those of you who, like me, want to lay in bed just a little bit longer. Grab your phone, spend time with God that way while you're cozy in bed, and hope maybe that's a good rhythm for you. Another idea is getting up a little bit earlier and leaving for the APU parking lot a little bit early to reduce the anxiety that you will experience if, with your frenetic last-minute um, pursuit of the final open spot. So maybe you get there early, do your devotions there. Remember, God has not promised us an abundant post-semester or post-graduation or post-married life. He promises us that kind of life the moment we choose to follow him. Consider proactively scheduling things into your daily planner rather uh, uh, that would be refreshing to you and not only the deadlines that I have imposed upon you. 
make your calendars more well-rounded, not deadlines only, but when are you going to refresh yourself? Who are you going to spend time with each day so that you have the energy going into the next day? You think that you'll have more time to be balanced when you leave your student status behind, but let me tell you, life will always be busy for you in different ways. As faculty, I, we all want you to do really well in our classes, but we also want you to grow holistically during your college experience. That requires that you build in daily discipline habits now. Jesus modeled that for us. We need to follow his lead. 2017 Christianity Today article says, it's entitled, The Science of Sinning Less. And it says this, that Sociologist Bradley Wright and psychiatrist David Carrion shared his research showing that people with more self-control live longer, are happier, get better grades, are less depressed, are more physically active, have lower resting heart rates, have less alcohol abuse, have more stable emotions, and are more helpful to others, get better jobs, earn more money, have better marriages, are more faithful in marriage, and sleep better at night. This lengthy list certainly motivates me to make some necessary changes in my life to develop healthier habits, and I hope it does for you as well. To conclude, what I want for you today is to believe it's possible to have an abundant life right now with the resources and opportunities surrounding you. Align yourself with God, your pack leader, and use self-control to develop that tenacity you need to do sustainable work when challenges come your way this year. Abundant living doesn't happen by osmosis. We have to work at it. Slow down, find ways to be grateful, choose an abundance rather than a scarcity mindset. Make a joy list. What makes you happy each day? Is it a warm beverage, a soft blanket, a hug from a friend, or holding the hand of someone you love? Find a memorized scripture that replaces your fears that are threatening to derail you. My daughter was certain that she was going to be abducted from her bed when she was little, so Psalm 4-8 went on her nightstand. It says, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Seek out resources if you need help developing these patterns. Let's go back to the painting. I want you to strive this year for perspective, not perfection. If you fixate on one aspect of this piece, you miss the work as a whole as the artist intended. Nonlinear paths are not random in God's economy. We can invest in or navigate different seasons of our lives knowing that He is working all things together for our good, even though we can't clearly see the end destination. In Stetzer in his Christianity Today article on abundance gives this challenge. Some Christians see themselves as containers complete with a lid. A container re stores resources, but a conduit delivers them. We should continually be pouring out into others what God is pouring out into us. Let us all agree today to be a conduit of authentic community this year that extends grace and encouragement as we work alongside of each other to strive to live more abundant lives. You're not treading water right now. You are building work habits you need to run the race well that lies ahead of you. Don't buckle to fear. Be confident in your identity as a Christ follower. There's a YouTube video that's called You Are Born to Win, Child of God. Watch it if you have a chance. And they capture this so well. They say, the enemy is terrified because you are sanctified. Fear is decimated in the light of that powerful truth. So finally, I want to leave you with a quote from A.A. A. Milne, the English author best known for his Winnie the Pooh books. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you think, and more loved than you will ever know. Don't waste another day, hour, or minute. Be intentional with your time and establish healthy habits so you can do sustainable, darn good work that becomes a conduit of blessing to others. Embra embrace this abundant living by replacing those four-letter words I mentioned. Fear, replace it with the word more. Replace lies with than. And take advantage of this one opportunity you will ever have to be encouraged by me to misspell your third four-letter word, which is enough. E-N-U-F. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength because you are more than enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you drive fear from this place and provide comfort and peace in the midst of our loss. Thank you for having broad shoulders to carry us when we are weak and providing perspective when we falter. 
I ask that you equip and empower us to see all opportunities to rest in your presence so we can live boldly, knowing that you alone equip us for all we need to live out the calling in our life. Help us to look for wisdom as we seek to honor you this year in our time and talents. In Jesus' name, amen. As you leave today,